Good afternoon and welcome to Tech Nation Webinar Wednesday. We want to thank you all for participating and are thrilled with the tremendous turnout for today's presentation, with over 195 attendees registered. Tech Nation is proud to offer these free webinars as a way to educate and provide valuable information to the healthcare technology industry. We will offer two to three webinars per month on Wednesdays focusing on issues pertinent to the biomed, clinical engineer, and imaging service community. We will always schedule the most sought after and dynamic speakers in the profession. We would like to mention that many of these same speakers and presentations are held at our triannual MD Expo. Our next event will be held October 1st through 3rd in Orlando, Florida. Please visit www.mdexposhow.com for the entire educational schedule and for more information. A few notes before we begin. Your participation today makes you eligible for one and a half CE credits. You will receive a post-webinar survey about today's presentation immediately once the webinar is over. Once the survey is complete and submitted, we will email you your certificate with the CE credit within one week. Earlier today, attendees were emailed an outline of today's presentation. If you didn't receive your copy, you can visit www.imtechnation.com slash webinars to download the PDF now. In today's webinar, all lines will be muted, but you can submit questions during the presentation by using the question feature on the dashboard on the right-hand side of the screen. If you are having difficulty, please email us webinar at mdpublishing.com. Tech Nation would like to thank today's sponsor, All Parts Medical. All Parts is a technical training, technical support, and replacement part supplier with a single focus on supporting imaging service organizations. All Parts enables service teams to perform more of the work themselves. All Parts delivers significant savings on replacement parts, providing a comprehensive technical support solution. Visit www.allpartsmedical.com to learn more. Our presenter today is Richard Gerler, Director, MVS Technical Operations at Philips Healthcare. Richard has 28 years customer service experience in the medical imaging field. He poses an in-depth knowledge of service operations at all levels and is highly proficient in strategy development, customer satisfaction, loyalty initiative, staff development, and training. Richard, whenever you're ready. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, well, first let me um, thank everybody for their time today. Um, I know we're all very busy in this um, healthcare environment and to take time out for something like this, I really appreciate your time and we'll try to make the best use of it as possible. Um, what I really want to talk to you about is um, really, you know, ultrasound, the modality itself as a migration path to um, starting like an imaging engineering um, self-service for your um, clinical engineering biomed department. And I think this would be relevant to um, people that aren't in an imaging engineering right now um, that have already started in um, one modality or another or strictly radiology engineering. It, um, I think it's relevant to just about all um, different departments and anybody in that uh, marketplace. So um, a little bit about myself. Um, just most of my experience is in ultrasound. Um, I've been in ultrasound for quite a while. Um, and, and really in the service industry for um, medical device imaging. And um, so overall, I mean, most of the experience that I've got from uh, understanding a hospital environment and hospital politics and hospital budgeting came from the five years I worked at Loyola University Medical Center in Maywood. Um, and we actually had um, really a, a separate imaging engineering department from our biomed engineering department. Within that department, I worked on all the ultrasound, all the radiation oncology and PAC systems, but, you know, we, we kind of crossed over to almost every modality. Um, and, and from that experience, you know, I, I went to work for um, Phillips Medical Systems as a regional service manager. And, you know, 
I mostly uh, was at RSM over the Midwest area and um, had the opportunity to really visit um, a lot of different um, imaging engineering departments, biomed departments, um, large hospitals, small hospitals. Um, it, it really was a mix where um, you had everything from large IDNs down to local community hospitals. But it was interesting to see the mix of how people were going about handling it, you know, from uh, not, not even entering into imaging engineering um, or any sort of imaging service to using it as almost like capital management and just sort of asset managing it. And that the people who really wanted to service everything completely independently. So there really was a wide spectrum. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, um, that I picked up as is that, you know, I, I've always felt that it's one of the most exciting ventures as a manager or director of your department to get into is, is imaging engineering. Just the, the idea of actually creating something new um, that actually has a big uh, impact to your organization, something that you can organically grow and develop yourself. Um, I, I think that's an exciting thing to do. And, um, and first and foremost, that's probably the, the first reason why you want to get into diagnostic imaging um, service yourself is for the, the sole reason is that you, you can be successful doing it. It's a good goal and it benefits your organization. It benefits your people um, and why not. So we'll talk about that. So um, so, so I want to start with, you know, why you want to get into diagnostic imaging in the first place and service that, you know, and the obvious reason is, you know, really comes down to what you would call cap, capital asset management, you know. It's really this um, idea that someone within an organization is really overseeing um, the entire install base of what your diagnostic imaging equipment is and what your costs are um, uh, beyond uh, more like a materials manager or a purchasing agent. So, um, And from that, you can actually see a significant savings if you get into servicing your own equipment, even on a first call basis. Um, you can really save money on your service contracts. Um, this slide is from um, the advisory board that I've gotten, and um, it, it shows the savings based on you know somewhere between four and six percent uh, of your actual equipment costs. So um, another reference to that is um, Amy lists you know the national average of service budgets by assets cost to be around 4.7%, which kind of falls in line with this. And that means that, you know, basically what something's cost the organization, 4.7% um, of that should be what you um, should budget um, to service that. And, um, you know, so that that's a great opportunity to show some significant savings to build your department up um, from those savings. And that's a year in, year out savings. As you see, um, the other the other benefit you see when you're managing a large equipment base like that, you really can pool your buying opportunities for service into more comprehensive agreements with with um, different OEMs, different parts vendors, and things of that nature. That nature, and I'll, I'll go into that in more detail later. But just you know, by pooling those buying opportunities, you're going to see more savings and actually get more features and benefits to your contracts that are more important to you um, than, you know, as opposed to paying for something you don't necessarily need to source some sort of cookie cutter contract. So um, the, the, the other reason why to get into service engineering is um, <clears throat> really kind of um, system life cycle management. Yeah, um, and that, that comes down to, you know, someone's got to sort of keep their eye on the ball in terms of, What's the age of the equipment, the, the technology level of it, what condition is it in, how much is it being utilized. Um, and that's something that your trained imaging engineers will keep track of and monitor for you. Um, it, it allows you to be a voice in capital asset budgeting, planning, um, determining end of life of equipment. Um, and it, it allows you to uh, participate in creating a, your hospital identity in terms of what equipment you really want to market and have, you know, in terms of keeping up with the Joneses around um, 
all the competing hospitals. Um, so, so that's another reason. The um, I I think really the just the ability that you're going to be able to do strong data collection um, to develop a real strategy to give that input to your capital asset managers to influence um, purchasing decisions um, because you'll be working with um, your department managers and directors of, of the imaging departments to, to really you know be a partner with them and talk about patient care okay and you know when you talk about patient care you're talking about what what capacity can their department um, in terms of patients and what the quality of that what kind of further diagnosis could you make if you um, upgraded to different equipment or upgraded existing equipment so um, and that, that, that's going to affect and influence your your capital planning as a whole and being able to have that uh, technical resource to those department managers um, to give viable solutions you know maybe upgrading a system versus buying a total new one you know um, and actually getting out of cycles where you just arbitrarily buy a new system every three or four years or every five or six years just because you know that's the budget cycle you know you're really managing that um, piece of equipment and that kind of um and, and then the last point of that is really just maintaining an accurate inventory of what your capital equipment is in the hospital organization um, and that that is almost amazing to me that the ineffectiveness of that in some facilities but you know managing the the entire collective of um, imaging engineering systems you know knowing where every ultrasound system is where every x-ray system is what the life what the age of it is what the upgrade level is and you know uh, and being able to sort of uh, have that conversation in terms of how those systems are being utilized within the hospital because you may know that there's a system an ultrasound system for example sitting up in um, an OR suite that's not being used at all that could be used in cardiology instead of buying a new system and um, nobody else I think in the organization is going to realize that except for an imaging engineering department that's really engaged in their capital equipment and their their inventory so um, and that's something that you know more and more is becoming a factor just because of you know obvious reasons in terms of reimbursements and things of that nature there, there's even um, something I was exposed to at a, a large hospital in Chicago where um, kind of their whole methodology of system utilization um, really got very detailed oriented where they were literally taking every piece of, of equipment and determining what the return on investment it was and the way they were calculating that is they were literally looking at what they had um, got submitted for for reimbursements based on studies and and looked at what the ROI is on that piece of equipment that way in, in terms of looking at it in terms of utilization and from that they were deriving what their future budgets would be and where their growth opportunities would be um, and that, that was kind of a, a new way of thinking about a piece of imaging engineering equipment but I, I think that may become more and more prevalent at least not maybe if not to that standpoint but at least the standpoint that you want to make sure that that system is 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 in physical use that it's being utilized in a facility to treat patients you know regardless to some degree what the reimbursement is on it um, so so those are some of the reasons um, from a capital asset management level the um, the other thing that I really kind of always have been passionate about is um, really ever since working in an in-house imaging engineering group is you know I've always thought it was the best model for service delivery um, and, and I say that you know it, as is it is my opinion but I, I do feel strongly about that and the reason I think that is that I mean if you can have um, a highly trained imaging engineer in your department that works on at least a modality if not two modalities and they understand you know the political environment of the equipment they understand the the equipment itself in terms of um, its mannerisms its um, um, 
I guess it's 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 service history in a way. And you know, nobody, no OEM, no third party group, nobody else can get there any faster than your imaging engineer can. They can usually be in the department 10 to 15 minutes after um, a service call happens and comes into your department. And that is really valuable from a standpoint that is, you know, when you talk about patient care, if you've got a patient on the table and there's a fault or an error or something like that, and that call can come into your imaging engineer, he can get there in 10, 15 minutes, and he can resolve that problem to, to the extent that you can continue and complete that study for that patient, and they don't have to be rescheduled or you know sent home and brought back another day. That that's an invaluable thing. You know, we, if you're really focused on patient care, so that's why you know in terms of just getting there um, with the response time is a huge factor. Plus, there there's really no good reason why your imaging engineer can't be highly effective in servicing your own equipment because there is training available. There's spare parts available, and there are tech support resources available for them. So they can do the majority of the work on your own systems, okay? Um, and that's going to, in the end, reduce your downtime. Just simply them getting there, um, knowing the history of the system, they can do the majority of the work themselves. And if you have these partnerships behind you in terms of technical support and parts and things of that nature, literally it, it's for lack of a better word, it's what's that group with the uh, the old commercials with the Verizon guy, where the old Verizon network standing behind them. That's really what they are. They're standing in a room in front of the system, in front of the patient, maybe in front of the end user, but they've got the support structure behind them to really support them. So all they have to do is pick up a phone um, to get additional assistance, and they'll they can walk out of that room the hero in in these situations. So I, I've always believed that that's the best service model. Um, and it's really kind of, like I said, it's focused on patient care, and that's the reason for it. So um, the other point in terms of service delivery, too, is um, really the, the preventive maintenance program. So it, you, can, and you can implement a, a standard preventive maintenance program that says, you know, this system gets 1 p.m. a year, 2 p.m. a year, 4 p.m. a year, um, just because it's this make and model of a system. But if you really have an effective imaging engineering department, they're going to understand the environment that system is in. They're going to understand the usage, how it's being used, whether it's low usage, high usage, whether there's interns working on it versus someone that um, you know, works on it each and every day that takes some ownership in it. Um, so they can adjust your preventive maintenance program to that specific system. And, and nobody else can really do that because nobody else, it, it's kind of like, you know, if you own an old car and you've had it for 20 years, you know everything about that old car. You know how it, you know, it starts up cold and, you know, hiccups a little bit times every, every this and that and, you know, needs this kind of oil and you know everything about that system and that's, that's the kind of ownership that your imaging engineer will have with your own systems where, you know, They'll understand that, you know, if you've got a department that uses a lot of linens, for example, that they need to go and vacuum out the, the filters every month. Or, you know, certain systems have, you know, the log file capacities and they have to go up and erase the logs every month to, to keep the system from going down. Or, you know, they know that, you know, you're, uh, just because I worked in radiation oncology, I knew a certain, you know, very linear accelerator that, you know, the 6X energy drifted on it. Um, and that the system would go down if I didn't, like, every couple of weeks go in there and sort of tweak it back and get it centered again. And it was maintenance that was done, but it's more preventive than it was corrective because I didn't allow the system to go down because I knew that that was going to happen and was reincurring. So there, there are things you can do with that that really improve your capacity. So. Let's talk about what makes up a great imaging engineering technician. And, and granted, this is truly just my opinion, again. But, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, some of the same things I look for um, as a regional service manager in terms of looking for a great field service engineer. And, you know, I, let's just throw it out there that, you know, 
they have to have good technical repair capabilities. You know, they've got to be able to false, fault isolate a system and troubleshoot a system, um, and that will come with the training. Um, so we'll just assume that this person already has all those repair capabilities, and that is, that's, that's a standard entry point into this position. Um, I, I often, you see that, you know, somebody that's been working in um, biomedical that has shown a, a great capacity to take on new projects that's creative, um, that's innovative, that, you know, seems to be someone you want to promote to the next level, making them an imaging engineering is a good promotion point for them. And it allows you to have um, some, uh, what you call it, um, <clears throat> promotional points in your, in your department to where there's advancement. So the, the second thing that, you know, makes up a good imaging engineering these days is you've got to have networking skills. Um, every imaging engineering system, um, diagnostic imaging system that is, is, is networked to some PAC system to this or that. So you've got to have a good understanding of what, you know, TCPIP structures are, DICOM, all, um, and, and just really kind of the basic networking within your facility. Um, so you, you can take an individual and you can train them. And I, I've, try to encourage everybody to, you know, some of the best courses you can get are at your local community colleges. Um, you can take individual courses and get your Network Plus uh, certificate. Um, there's actually an A Plus certificate. There's a, a lot of Microsoft certification, like your MCSC, MCSA courses that you can take. Um, and hopefully these would be something you would encourage for reimbursement um, for your, your staff to take to gain some of these networking skills, because it's going to pay dividends for you in the long run. So um, the, the, the third thing that I really like, um, I kind of put this slide together, um, is really kind of what I call like the four P's. And, you know, pride and passion are, 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 are the two big ones. And, you know, I, I've always said, you, you know, you, you just know and you sense a good employee because they really take pride in all their work. They're proud of the, what their department and the way it's viewed by other um, departments and outside entities. And they're, they're proud of the organization they work for, okay? They, they wear their uniform with pride. They wear their name badge with pride, okay? Um, and and I, I just encourage, that's something, you know, that um, I love about individuals. And, you know, the second thing is passion. You can't not replace passion. It's just you either, in my mind, you either love working and fixing, it, you know, something, whether it's, um, you know, a heart pump or it's a uh, MRI or a CT, you actually have a passion for fixing stuff. And, and ultimately, you have a passion for delivering patient care. And I, and I always, you know, question that, you know, it's not just a break-fix environment. You are really impacting patients in this area of, you know, clinical engineering. So, you know, you need to um, really have that passion for delivering patient care just as much as the person handling the patient themselves, and really have a commitment to excellence that should be permeating throughout your entire organization. So, um, the other P was political savvy, and you know, I'll be careful with this one, but. Um, you know, through my experiences at hospitals, both as an in-house engineer and as an RSM, I mean, you understand that there are power bases within hospitals. There are um, doctors and directors that, uh, you know, just have more political clout than other people do. And you got to understand those um, when you decide to make a stand on something or um, <laughs> why not. So, and then the other part of it is, too, is that, you know, it, as you enter into growing and getting into imaging engineering, you really do have to market and self-promote yourself internally to your group. And, and that's maybe something that a lot of, you, you don't want to use the um, stick, you know, if you're talking about carrot or stick. You really want to use the carrot on that and talk and, and have a, a meetings with your managers and directors in these imaging departments and talk about the training you guys are going under, what your roadmap is to 
you know, continue entering into different modalities and keep promoting the, the cost savings that you're providing the hospital. Never lose sight of that. And, and literally, you've got to sell and resell this almost every year. Um, you know, I, I just don't assume that, um, you know, you're safe, <laughs> I guess, you know, because everybody's always looking to save a buck. And I think the more you stay in front of that in terms of promoting your department, the, the better off you're going to be in the long term. And, and really, um, the last one is perseverance. And, and, you know, we talk about, you know, focus on a purpose, you know, and knowing what their role is within your organization, knowing what they are responsible for, and really owning that. Um, and then ability to accept and handle adversity, you know, because you're going to run into situations where, you know, maybe they're in front of a system, they don't have the right part, you know, and they're under pressure to get it fixed, and you want them to be able to handle that adversity well, okay, because they're always going to get compared to someone else that did better. And in those cases, you know, handling that with maturity um, is going to pay off for you in the long run. So, so those are the, the ideas that I have for what would make a great imaging engineer. And, and I know they're very generic, and, and they're really any employee for that matter. So, so let's get into the main topic here is why start with servicing an ultrasound modality. And um, first I wanted to say that there's really no right or wrong modality to start with. It, this is only my opinion on what, on why ultrasound would be good. And, you know, in the past my experience has been that a lot of people get into imaging engineering and start with um, x-ray, start with portables, C-arms, you know, Bucky, that kind of stuff, and there's nothing wrong with doing that that way. Um, I'm only trying to promote the fact that starting with ultrasound maybe isn't a bad idea either. You know, there are a lot of similarities to x-ray in terms of ultrasound as well, too. Uh, you know, the first one is that unlike a, an MR and CT modality, Ultrasound, generally speaking, there is some redundancy within the uh, many of the larger departments where your, your cardiology department is going to have multiple systems, your general radiology is going to have multiple systems, your OB-GYN is going to have multiple systems. There, there's something that if one goes down, the entire department's not going down. I mean, there may be some scenarios in the smaller hospital that where that's the case, but I'm just speaking generically. There is some redundancy in mid to large size hospitals. And that's very similar to an x-ray room. So to, let's, the pressure to perform under, and the, the performance under pressure is less, okay? So you've got um, a longer noose, shall we say. <laughs> so, um, and the other thing that's interesting to, uh, in terms of similarities to x-ray too, is that there, there really are multiple system types there's multiple LEMs. There's many different um, uh, model types. And um, I'll show you here in the, like the lower picture just some of the systems that, at all parts that we have here that we train on. I mean, you know, GE alone in ultrasound has probably, uh, you know, 50 different system types. And so, but the, the thing to remember, and the thing to remember about ultrasound and x-ray is that Generally speaking, there is a basic block diagram. There's a basic flow and functionality of every ultrasound system as well, too. Okay, um, I mean they all have you know a front end section that transmits and receives echoes. They all have a back end that basically puts it into TV timing, puts it up on the monitor, display the echoes for you. There's a power supply, a user interface, um, control panel, and there's a monitor. You know. The fault isolation and troubleshooting techniques of, you know, one model type versus another model type are generally basically the same. It's the same mindset because, you know, if, once your imaging engineer gets trained on basic ultrasound, he should be able to walk up to just about any ultrasound and tell you if it's functional or not. Secondly, a lot of symptoms that he would see, he would automatically be able to say, hey, that's a front end problem. That's a monitor problem. That's a user interface problem. That looks like power supply. I mean, he can break it down into those functional models because it's generically true across most ultrasound systems. The same way, 
you know, a generator problem or a table problem or a tube problem would be for an extra room. So it isn't necessarily important to get trained on every model type. It, you know, you can get trained on the systems that you have the most of, but you will have some troubleshooting and some experience um, to pull from to service every model and every OEM type. And um, so I got over this. The other thing I want to talk about is transducers as well, too. Um, and that's where you know you you would have um, for for the for the most part, generically speaking, you've got um, the same cardiac probes, the same nomenclature, and that you know, you're going to see cardiac probes that are generally somewhere between two and five megahertz. Um, they're all phased array probes. You're going to see the same um, endo cavity probes being the same frequencies and same look and style. Um, General abdominal probes can be anywhere from you know three to seven, to even nine megahertz. You know, um, and then you got vascular probes. You know that for near near field and venous studies that you know are going to be in that upper frequency band of you know somewhere between nine and fifteen megahertz, or even up to seventeen megahertz for that matter. But you know you can go to any ultrasound system and and literally by looking at whether it's a phased array a convex array, a linear or an inner cavity type of probe, and look at the frequency. You can you can determine what that probe should be used for in terms of what procedures. So the functionality of almost every system should be apparent to you. And that's something you can get from a, a good basic ultrasound training course. So, <clears throat> so the other part too is that, I mean, ultrasound has been around for a very long time. Um, there are some dominant um, OEMs in the marketplace, and there are really a high level of spare parts in the marketplace that are available. So that's another thing like X-ray. I mean, you can go out there and get, you know, spare parts. Um, and, and actually, the, the, the availability of technical training is, is abundant within ultrasound as well, too. Um, OEMs, for the most part, offer biomed courses on all their systems. Um, I know even I mean, you take somebody like, you know, Philips Ultrasound, which I work for, um, and they, if you bought like a, a first response type of agreement, they actually included the training entitlement in there right in the contract. You didn't have to pay another time for it. It was a nice benefit to have. So they're promoting the fact that you, they want to train you. And you've also got other places, you know, like all parts that were, you know, we can provide a basic training course uh, for ultrasound, and we can actually train individual systems, you know, um, you know, all the GE products, all the semen products, um, the logic books, the vivid eyes, you know, um, pretty much everything, you know, we're getting into and have training courses for. So the ability to get technical training, the ability to get spare parts is, is high. And that all supports why you would want to get into imaging, engineering, ultrasound. So the um, I think the big reason why I've always felt strongly why ultrasound over x-ray, um, and it, it kind of comes down to, you know, just my own experiences. And so when you're talking about ultrasound, you you have, I think most people would be surprised once they started counting how many ultrasounds they have in their hospital, you know, because they may think, oh, there's just this many in radiology, this many in cardiology. but there are ultrasounds sitting in your vascular labs and in your ER, in your um, operating rooms. You know, ob has got some, labor and delivery's got some, PEDS cardiology has it. Um, even like your outpatient clinics and things like that may actually have an ultrasound system there. There, there are ultrasounds being used for clinical studies here and there. You know, I know, um, I just let Loyola University alone, and this is going back to early 2000, I mean, there were like 85 ultrasound systems that I serviced that were just at, you know, within Loyola. Um, you know, all different makes and manufacturers, and that's, that gets me into the advantage of this. Um, if you launch into an ultrasound modality as a reason to get into imaging and engineering, your span of influence is immediately across many different departments all at once, okay? It's not just a radiology for x-ray type of thing. You, you're really affecting 
and you're, you can actually go out and influence and impact multiple departments all at once. So every department that has an ultrasound system, you can reach out to and actually um, budgeting, budgets are kind of um, a, a sore subject, but you know, um, ultimately you could attempt to try to consolidate those budgets for servicing those systems into one larger budget. Even so, if, if you take all those and take over the service of all those and negotiate the contracts or negotiate the service of that um, in terms of parts and training or however, whatever it is you decide in terms of your service model, um, you can do that across a larger spectrum. And you'll be surprised what your savings and impact can be. And you'll be affecting multiple departments. Okay? You know, my, I, I've seen a lot of examples out there where people have started in working on x-ray just in radiology and they've not really moved past that. You know, because maybe, um, you know, another department has just put up a fence like cardiology say, well, I don't want them over here working on our systems. And that that's not what you want to get into. You know, and I just... I think that blitzkrieg type of mentality where you just, I'm going to go take over and I'm going to get, have an impact across all these different departments, departments all at once is, is kind of the way to go with this and actually show that you can deliver on service in those departments and, um, and then your reputation will allow you to span into other modalities within those departments. So the, um, the other reason to get into ultrasound is, is really Ultrasound is a growth modality. Um, of any other, you can see here that um, CT and ultrasound systems by this um, Millennium Research Group. I mean, ultrasound service is going to expand, uh, you know, throughout through, through, through 2017. And um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for that, and I probably would need another hour to go over all the different reasons why that's the case. But you know, just a couple of them, you know. Um, it, it, it's a very low cost imaging option, okay? And it's the lowest, the least expensive imaging option of almost all modalities, okay? So the the fact that it's you know non-invasive, it doesn't have any ra radiation, and the fact coupled with the fact that you've got ultrasound systems over the last 10 years that it has significantly improved in terms of image quality and what they're able to um, do in, in terms of um, diagnosis, um, those have expanded. They, they literally take the place of some CT studies, some MR studies, okay? And, and that's probably the biggest difference in its growth is the fact that instead of just being a screening before you get a CT and you do a screening ultrasound before you go get an MR, now you're actually getting scanned for an ultrasound the, the radiologist is able to make a diagnosis based on that ultrasound image, and you're not going to a CT, you're not going to an MR. So it's allowing it to grow, and the fact that it's not a, a multi-million dollar investment that you, that's going to sit and plant and get bolted down on the floor somewhere, you know, hospitals are more willing, generally speaking, to go ahead and buy that additional ultrasound right now than they are to make another investment in another CT or another MR, just because of the fact that um, they're, they're seeing a good return on it, okay? So, so those are some of the reasons why ultrasound is a growth um, modality. And I, I'm sure there's more reasons, but um, your, your, your um, OEM salesperson will tell you more about that. So um, the other thing is, you know, there, there really is a minimal test, amount of test equipment that you need to service ultrasound. Um, you, you, you can get by with a... a you know, really a multimeter and a leakage tester, two things that you probably already have within your department. Um, I, I would recommend a, a tissue phantom of some kind, you know, a 0 0.5, 0 0.7, you know, uh, decibel type of tissue phantom that allows you to quantify um, uh, image quality and, um, and document it, okay? So that's the other part. You don't have to buy any big fancy, you know, generators or this or that. Um, and then the, um, the, the, the other reason for um, ultrasound, too, is that, you know, the only other modality is, is comparable to it is, um, is MRI. But, you know, the fact that you can actually take your ultrasound transducers and 
go and have them repaired and returned and without you know any downtime you know other than maybe the day it takes to ship there and back but you can actually get generally speaking there's a loaner pool that's available when you actually send a probe out for repair so generally speaking you're you're sending your probe out for repair and the next day you're getting a loaner you're back in service and then you pay for the repair um, you get your original probe back and you put in back to service send the loaner back and um, that you know, I mean MRI Comparatively speaking, you, know, you can do that with some coils, um, but that is a great advantage um, to that ultrasound modality. The fact that you can actually get probes repaired. There, there's very little, few things you can you couldn't take a tube and send it out and get a loaner and put a tube in and and whatnot. So, I think that's an opportunity if managed correctly, um, where you can actually see a significant amount of cost savings for your facility, um, and that ultimately helps you. You know, like I said, market your own department and show your um, your impact. So, the um, the other thing I was going to go to talk about is really kind of um, the flexibility in developing service partnerships, and and this is 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 really kind of across all modalities. But uh, you know, I always found that you know when I walked in as an ultrasound RSM to a lot of places, I I had a lot of flexibility to really customize agreements to whatever whatever the department needed. I literally could like a la carte take different deliverables and say, okay, these are things, this is how much they cost, what is important to you, where are you at in the course of developing your own imaging department, how can we help you do that, and, and put together a service offering that either met their current needs or actually provided them a roadmap to get them to where they wanted to be. You know, so that's that's something with an ultrasound where you can you can actually have these shared service agreements, you know, where you're, you know, first and foremost where you can have where your engineer is um, doing completely first call on it. And um, but yet he's got you got parts coverage or you've got um, some secondary labor included into it. And so your engineer is going, taking a call. If he can't first fix it on a first pass or changes the part out and doesn't fix it, then he can actually have the OEM FSE come in and help him out and fix it. So um, the other option to that would actually be not to have the labor coverage at all, where you just have tech support and parts to where, you know, you are doing still doing all the service, but you're um, – you don't have that advantage of having the maybe you don't maybe you got a, a good enough imaging engineer you don't need the OEM ever to come out and if so it may be more feasible for you to pay it on a transactional basis um, <clears throat> another thing you can do with ultrasound <clears throat> and you know this may be across something that you could develop across different um, OEMs as well too is you know kind of like a probe replacement pool you know something where um, Let's keep it simple. Say you take all your Philips ultrasound systems and you have 30 different Philips ultrasound systems on site. You can actually develop a pro pool and say, well, I, I think my usage is going to be, um, you know, one per system or 30 probes. So I don't want to only want to buy coverage for 30 probes um, replacements at 100 percent, and then I'll take risk on the rest. And Philips can put together something like that, and, and so can other OEMs, to where. Um, and, and you may even look at it from a standpoint that I, I, I want to go beyond just an OEM specific pool like that. I want to go across different OEMs. I want to take every ultrasound system I have and only cover one probe replacement at 100% and, and put it in a pool and, and use it that way. So you can negotiate those types of agreements. Um, and um, so I mentioned like parts only agreements as well too where you get training, tech support, and parts. Um, and, and then ultimately, there's um, a lot of organizations, and All Parts Medical is one of those that um, I continually want to plug here. That you know, we can you know, you can get discounts based on your total spend as well too. So you can say, okay, instead of actually having all my parts covered, I want to have a targeted spend with you. Okay. So I know that typically I spend X number of dollars per year servicing ultrasound modality period, right? 
and you can actually sort of say, okay, based on that, I want to pre-negotiate a discount on that, knowing that I'm going to have that kind of spend with you. And you can um, negotiate that kind of agreement. And it's, it's a very valuable way to, um, to partner with a parts vendor or OEM and actually get discounts based on what your spend is across, you know, all these different systems. Um, there's a lot of um, value incentive programs that are out there. Um, and one of them, like All Parts is offering right now, is you know even with a certain amount of spend, you're going to get free training for an ultrasound, you know, class. You know, so here and again, going back to the earlier point that training is 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 very available. You know, it, it's almost um, to the point that where we all want you to take training. Okay, we want to promote and we want to partner with you to service your own systems and help you with the tech support and parts piece of that. So, you know, I mean, in, in the end, the rule of the day is that there is an option available for you, whatever your circumstance, wherever you're at in terms of progressing into imaging engineering, um, the, the independent of your level of experience of your own staff, there is an option available for you. And there's also a partnership, you know, you can find a partner out there that is going to help you get from where you want are now to where you want to be, you know, and and help you roadmap that out and and put a plan in place to get you there, and that you know ultimately will include some sort of savings for your facility by doing that. So, in the end, I mean, like I said, I would partnerships are very important. I, I think you always need to maintain partnerships with your OEMs. I would encourage everybody, if you've got um, equipment, I would almost say you should meet once or twice or four times a year with your OEMs just to talk about service, okay, and what is coming up for service and what they can do for you. Um, same way with, you know, your uh, partners that you're getting parts for. You should meet with them regularly. Um, you should continually talk about what your goals are and where you want to be and how you can help each other. So um, nothing bad ever comes from meeting. You know, good, good things come from having conversations. So, so let me just kind of recap. You know, I, I hope I you know, explained to you why I thought you should get into imaging and engineering service. I mean, we kind of talked about capital asset management, you know, life cycle management, system utilization. All right. We talked about you know the attributes of a great service engineer, and I really emphasized the four P's: you know, pride, passion, perseverance, and political savvy. Right. Um, and I hope you um, feel free to use that as much as you want. Um, and then we talked about why really ultrasound was a good modality, um, why it, why it was very similar to X-ray in some ways in terms of having multiple systems, um, good redundancy. Um, there's availability to spare parts, technical training. Um, we really talked about the advantages of ultrasound in that it's a growth modality. Um, the fact you can implement your department across multiple um, imaging departments. You know, um, talk about probe repair. And then lastly, we talked about really um, the flexibility and all the different service partnerships you can make and why you want to have those strategic partnerships. But I think the one thing that, you know, I, I kind of want to close this before we start taking questions with is, um, you know, the fact that, um, you know, that I talked about before about it being the best service model. You know, the fact that, you know, when it comes to patient care, getting your guys there the, the fastest, diagnosing the problem, helping that patient, first and foremost, you know, in terms of service delivery model, like I said, I feel passionate about that and, you know, that, I think is the reason to do all of this and just want to leave you with that that you know that is something that you know at all parts medical we believe in and you know we do have the training we've got the parts we've got the tech support and we can help you get there and help you be that way um, and, and deliver great service to your end users and your patients so I with that I will um, say thank you I wanted to really thank MD Publishing and Tech Nation for putting this together and All Parts Medical for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today and um, I'd like to go ahead and open it up to questions if I could.
Well, that was great, Richard. And uh, we do have a few questions from the audience. And as a reminder, uh, you can still submit questions from the panel on the right side of the screen. So Richard, do you think that in-house imaging engineering departments will continue to grow in the next five years? Oh, I think absolutely. I think if you look at the current market and the current pressure that is being put on us with um, you know, health care reform, I think you're, you're going to have to manage your assets, your, especially your imaging engineering, or your imaging, diagnostic imaging assets a, a lot stricter than you have in the past and really look at it um, from a different perspective in terms of um, you know how you how you budget for new equipment, how you extend the life cycle of a system, and how you keep uh, a system up and running. And like, like I said before, I, I don't think there's anybody. I, I think it's pretty evident that the imaging engineering department can take ownership of that system and actually do all those things. So um, I, I just, there's been a huge movement in the last five years toward this, and I just think that's going to explode and continue to keep going. So. Okay, great. That's a great question. Uh, next question is, where can I send my imaging engineer for ultrasound service training? Well, you know, I, I, I'd be um, shameless if I didn't um, uh, mention that, you know, that All Parts Medical does have, um, like I said, we've got a basic ultrasound course to get you started in the modality. There are um, GE e courses for the E9. Vivid E9, Bayesan E8, you know, Bayesan 730s, 530s, um, some of the older equipment, you know, all the Siemens SC2000s, S2000s. Um, we've got all these courses set up and are going to be offered. Um, so first and foremost, I would say us, but um, there are a lot of alternatives out there, and there's a lot of great trainers out there as well, too. So um, like I said, there's really a lot of availability. Okay, great. Next question that came in is why would we want to partner with all parts versus other vendors? I think that the, the, the one advantage of all parts is the fact that we do have a, a wide variety of parts availability, technical experience on various modalities. Um, I mean, We've got MR systems here, CT systems here, um, all these QA test bays for CT. I think we've got 12 different CTs set up here. Um, I showed you the picture of all the ultrasound systems we have here. We have the systems to go stand in front of and to provide the tech support. Um, we've got the training. Um, I, I think ultimately, you know, we're tested and proven as well too. And there's great quality parts that we deliver. And um, in the end, I think that's really, you know, our experience and um, our quality. Okay. Um, do you have training available for Philips ultrasound systems? So All Parts Medical, we don't offer training for um, the Philips ultrasound systems specifically, but Philips does offer that training um, out of our Cleveland training facility. So it, it would be redundant for us to have it here as well too. But they do teach a, a really great biomed clinical engineering course. And that can be coupled into some sort of a partnership agreement as well too, where you can get training at Cleveland or here. All right, next question is, how would you approach vendors for service and PM documentations in particular that they are not required to provide? Hmm. <clears throat> you know, I, I'm going to sound a lot less like a vendor right now, but it, as I sat on that side of the aisle, shall we say, and sat down with vendors, it, it's really in their best interests to partner with you and ensure that you're successful in what you need to do. And first and foremost of that is you've, if you've taken the path and decision you're going to maintain and service your own equipment, you need the documentation and the, especially the preventive maintenance procedures to do that. So, you know, 
I think you've got to put pressure to get those documents, or at least at least what, from a procedural standpoint, you should be doing. A lot of that should always be provided in any basic training course as well, too, is the, the preventive maintenance procedure. Um, I know, really, even through Phillips Multi-Vendor Services, we spend a great deal of effort determining and researching what the original OEM's PM procedure is, and that becomes our PM procedure as we go out and service it for multi-vendor service. And that's just because we want to follow the OEM specifications, and I see the importance of that for doing it as customers. So I would continue, if you're having issues with that, I would continue to escalate up the chain, shall we say, and and if need be, pull a sales rep in if you're having a problem and explain to them what his future um, may look like as your facility if indeed that's not forthcoming. Okay, great. Next question is, what are service keys used for ultrasound and does all parts training have the ability to obtain these keys if needed for repairs? There, now, it depends on what keys you're talking about. I know, for example, like um, one of the things that Philips Ultrasound does really well is when you get trained as a, as a biomed and take their biomed training course for their ultrasound equipment, you really do have uh, access to keys. So that's something like you can get from the OEMs usually. Um, generally speaking, um, we try to teach people how to troubleshoot the system and diagnose the system um, regard with or without the keys. If the key is something we, you have to go and pay for, for the OEM, we will train you on how to not use the key to still fix the system. Um, and if you have to buy the key, it, you know, you have to buy it from the OEM. So. Okay, with CMS now officially designating ultrasound as an imaging device that is not radiation emitting, what is your thoughts about the risk-based approach towards PM of ultrasound? I am actually not sure how to answer that question. I'm not familiar with risk-based approach. Okay, that's all right. We'll move on to the next question. How detailed of testing do you suggest with a phantom? Well, with, with a particular tissue phantom, I mean, I've, I've always felt that, you know, uh, you, you just take a simple AIUM standardization where you're, you're looking at lateral resolution, you're, you're going to look at, um, uh, um, you know, uh, how close you can define, usually within a tissue phantom there's a couple pins that are, you know, 0.1 or 1 millimeter apart from each other, and you, you want to be able to actually identify those. Um, Generally speaking, there are some cystic structures that are round, and you want to be able to see that they're actually round, so you measure from side to side, um, um, top to bottom as well, to ensure that they're round. Um, and then, you know, on some tissue phantoms now, you, you have um, different type of cystic structures that vary based on their dB level. So they're, generally speaking, there's one I know of that is um, goes from like 0 to minus 3 dB to minus 6 to minus 9. So you want to be able to, to distinguish, you know, the background of the phantom to these um, different type of um, um, structures inside of it and know that your grayscale looks appropriate. So, I mean, that's, that's a degree that I would go to, but um, that's just, you know, looking. It, it, it's a 360 evaluation of the system as well, too. And that when you actually scan something, you're, you're transmitting something, you're receiving it back, and it's up on the screen for you to see. Um, so you really are testing the whole system out when you're, you're scanning a phantom. And it should be consistent from, from one time to another. Okay, next question is, my major problems are service manuals. Is it possible to get documentation from you, and how? Well, one of the things that we're actually doing at All Parts Medical, and I say I say this that it it will be released by next year, is we're really trying to brand our own 
service manuals for some equipment just because some service manuals are not readily available through the OEM. Um, so those will be offered as part of our training classes is our own service manual for it. It is always recommended that you follow the OEM's original procedures and calibrations and such. But, um, I, you know, I, I actually thought, and I, I don't want to misspeak here, but it was my understanding that if you own a, a system, that the OEM had to sell you a service manual for it. But I could be wrong. Okay. Uh, next question is, do you have spare parts for Toshiba ultrasound and CT equipment? Yeah, we we do have uh, you know some Toshiba ultrasound parts here. Um, you know, Athleo, Zario. Um, you know, we, we we are getting a fair number of trade-in systems from that we were harvesting. Um, Toshiba CT. Um, I, I would say we have some sparingly parts. You know. Um, uh, we do offer a training course for like the Aquan 64. We have one here that we train on as well too. And we have some spare parts for that. So, Okay. And final question. In your opinion, who should be responsible for ACR performance verification for ultrasound accreditation? The OEM vendor when under a service contract versus the in-house imaging engineer versus a physicist? Hmm. Boy, that is a. I could get in trouble by answering that question. That's a very political answer question. But um, you know, I mean, ultimately, you know, I, I'll just say from my experience when I worked at Loyola was ultimately the physicist really is responsible for it. Now they may delegate that to an, an, another individual to actually acquire it, the images and things of that nature. I, I would tend to say whoever's doing the preventive maintenance on the system is responsible and responsible for it should be acquiring your your whatever criteria you need at least acquiring the images you need for ACR accreditation. And I mean, for the many years I was an FSC, I, I never hesitated to do that for any customer. You know, um, a lot of places would just say, "Okay, these are the images I need." You know save them to this name or print them out on this film and leave them with me. And that was part of the PM. That's part of the, the service value that you add. So I hope that answered that question. Well, thank you, Richard, for your time and wisdom today. And thank you to All Parts Medical for sponsoring today's event. You can learn more about All Parts Medical by visiting www.allpartsmedical.com. Remember, to receive your CE certificate, you will need to submit the post-webinar survey, which will appear immediately on your computer screen once the webinar is complete. Please visit www.imtechnation.com slash webinars to register for our webinars in September. If you have any questions, you can email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Thank you, and have a great afternoon.